Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Welcome to 21 Coronation Close, where the technological revolutions of the 50s have transformed the interior into a cool, funky vision of the future. But I haven't finished yet. The outside needs a serious scientific transformation because it frankly looks like a tip. So this is what our garden and millions of others in Britain would have looked like in 1950. These vegetable patches are left over from the previous decade, where we were growing our own fruit and vegetables to help us win the war. But over here, we've still got an Anderson shelter, which was to protect the families during the Blitz, but, you know, essentially just a tin shed covered in sandbags. You really wouldn't want to spend a night in this thing. And over here, this was where the chickens were kept. The garden was the part of the home most steeped in the deprivations of the war and its aftermath, and most in need of a makeover. And yet, in just ten short years, it would be transformed into this. A little slice of heaven, full of bright flowers and clean, modern garden design. A sumptuous room outdoors that would take centre stage in 50s family life. And to find out how it happened, I've got to go back to the start of the decade. I've invited round some green-fingered neighbours with first-hand experience of gardening in the 50s. There isn't any rhubarb. No. no. Everyone would have had <laughs> rhubarb. <laughs> Though they seem worried I'm not growing enough fruit and veg. The whole of this area here would have been at least potatoes and things mm. like carrots and onions, simple veg. To my surprise, they seem to be unanimous that I should put my 50s makeover on hold for at least a few years. Rationing went on, food rationing, so everybody grew stuff yeah. in their back garden. Everybody had allotments mm. and grew yeah. vegetables and what have you, yeah. 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 At the start of the 50s, Britain was arguably in a worse state food-wise than during the height of the Second World War. Sugar and butter were rationed until 1953, meat and bacon until June 1954, when all rationing was finally brought to an end. 1950 was not the time to be thinking of pretty flowers. The garden was a resource, vital for boosting the meagre post-war rations of austerity Britain. We had gooseberries, we had raspberries, we had strawberries, we had a huge vegetable patch. We grew beans and a lot of fruit, red currants, black currants, raspberries. I love raspberries. So I should really be thinking about maximising the productivity of my garden, and that will mean using every square inch of space. And how about our Anderson shelter? Yeah. Obviously, the whole of the top there would have been covered over on the... I wondered. Yeah, yeah that yes. would have been soil over there completely. Yeah, and you, could grow you grew that. things on top of that, yeah. so yeah. that yeah. they, yeah. yeah. So it's like a, a living roof. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, yes. 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 Before I can grow more fruit and veg, I'll need to enrich the soil. It's been hammered for the past five years and badly needs a boost. What were you feeding your plants? I think people used horse manure and mm. yeah, bone meal. We used the baker, the milkman, they all had yeah. horse-driven vehicles who very kindly deposited their manure in the street. Most gardeners in the early 50s had to rely on organic matter to add nutrition to the soil either from a compost heap or a passing tradesman. Well, not the tradesmen themselves, they're horses. For my mother's horror, my dad would rush out with a shovel and shovel up the manure, you know, that they might have dropped in the street and use it for the garden. He would rush out and make sure that he was first there to get that shit in the bucket before anybody else did and race back in and spread it over his garden. My grandfather had a motorcycle and sidecar, right? And he would, he would stop dead if there was a load of horse dung in the middle of the road and pull over and shovel it, into the, shovel it into the sidecar with you, you know. So, did these traditional ways of keeping soil fertile really work? 
I'm off to meet Marty Jobson, my stable mate in all things scientific, to find out just what went on in the gardens of post-war Britain and why. And it would seem that horses really were very handy. This stuff is horticultural gold. It's absolutely chock full of nitrogen, which is one of the key nutrients that plants need to grow, you know, really well. But horse manure was just one of the somewhat random mixture of ingredients we were chucking on our gardens. Organic fertiliser was a veritable smorgasbord of stomach-turning constituents. So here's my horse shit. A good source of nitrogen needed for shoots growth. And if you haven't got any poo, kitchen waste was all right too. Next, not raw bones like these, but bone meal. These aren't quite ground up yet. An excellent source of phosphorus, needed for root growth and greenery. Stick that in. Now some wood ash, which contains potassium. Particularly important for sort of fruits and flowers. Flowers, yeah, exactly. And anything else organic? Chuck that in as well. I think I know what you had for dinner last night. <laughs> <laughs> Chips, gammon, fried eggs. <laughs> We'd been making fertiliser like this for thousands of years. It looks vile, but if you're a plant, it's delicious because it's packed with all the food you need if you could get it. In the dark days of World War II, organic fertiliser was in short supply. So many fields and gardens had been turned over to food production that Britain faced a manure shortage until science came up with a solution. And there's one person who I think deserves to be thanked for this. So he's going into my Hall of Fame. And for once, it's not a scientist or inventor, but a government minister. In the history of British silage, this guy probably needs a chapter all to himself. This is first by count Robert Hudson, the Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries during the Second World War. Looks rather dashing in his top hat. It was Hudson's job to make sure that farmers and landowners utilised every acre of soil to help keep the nation from starvation. And as part of that Dig for Victory campaign, scientists formulated a new fertiliser that took out the randomness of the old fertilisers and created the perfect mixture of nutrients to keep the fields of Britain producing food. This is the man who introduced National Grow More to help a nation feed itself during a time of crisis. National Grow More was Britain's first all-purpose chemical fertiliser. And by the early 50s, gardeners and their families were reaping the benefits of this wonder chemical compound. And we're making our own National Grow More, by replacing those hard-to-get organic ingredients with a recipe full of the crucial chemicals plants need to grow. So, in the absence of lots of horse poo, what you can use is ammonium nitrate. Nitrogen is an essential nutrient for plants, and ammonium nitrate is one of the best ways a plant can absorb this vital chemical. Well, that's one of the ingredients for explosives. So the same stuff that was being used to blow things up is also being used to make things grow. Ironic, mm, eh? Yeah. And the clever thing is, it's made by a Nobel Prize winning chemical process that captures nitrogen from the Earth's atmosphere and combines it with hydrogen to make this plant-friendly substance. Phosphorus. Next, you add some of this, super phosphate of lime. It looks like super sand. <laughs> super sand, yeah. It's chemically processed rock, and like bone meal, it's rich in phosphorus. So that goes in. And then the final active ingredient, Potash. And you actually just dig this straight out of the ground. Probably one of the only natural ingredients in this whole mix. Exactly. It's a mineral salt, and like wood ash, it's packed with potassium. Stick that in, add a bulking agent, and there you have it. Britain's first all-purpose synthetic fertiliser. And it's fantastic. You put this on your plants, and they'll grow huge and lush and verdant. And people loved it. And in the 1950s, it was everywhere. People were putting it on their roses and they were putting it on their little vegetable plots and on their grass to make it nice and green. National Grow More contained nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium in a formula that could be produced in bulk and was easy to handle. The days of chasing after horses with a bucket were gone. Back in the 50s, this must have looked like a miracle substance. Indeed, it did. In the decade when people believed science could solve almost any problem, National Grey Moor was a sensation. And even 70 years on, it's still the country's most popular basic fertiliser. But there were other so-called wonder chemicals in the 1950s garden that aren't with us any longer, and for good reason. 
I would have had a whole arsenal of deadly substances at my disposal to deal with the army of slugs and bugs munching on my spuds and sprouts. There's this spray, H-E-T-P, great for getting rid of greenfly. And it works by cleverly knocking out their central nervous system. I can use a special powder to kill off cabbage fly and prevent disease. <coughs> There's even a gas to knock out moths and insects. <coughs> With this chemical arsenal, I now have the firepower to win the war against pests. There's just one teeny drawback. They might kill me. That powder? Calomel, packed with toxic mercury. The gas? Naphthalene. A big enough dose can cause fever and convulsions. The rose spray? A byproduct of Nazi nerve agents. Deadly. So I haven't actually been using the real 50s pesticides because most of them are now banned. They're simply too dangerous. And there was one 50s garden chemical prized above all others. Dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane, or DDT. It's great at wiping out nasty little things like wasps, caterpillars and mosquitoes. One whiff and oh, they're going to spasm when they've snuffed it. The nation couldn't get enough of it. Well, until it was banned in the UK in 1984. They used to spray DDT around. If ants, ants and things were around, DDT powder would be put around wherever, wherever they were, you know? Food rationing finished in 1954, and people could finally turn their outside spaces from a place of work into a place of play. Gardens like mine could be used once again for the very British pursuit of growing things, because they looked nice. The garden of 21 Coronation Close is finally shaking off its wartime gloom and getting ready to bloom. Remember that old Anderson shelter? Well, it's gone and we've got the start of a patio here. And down here, these stones are going to go around the patio and become a lovely rockery feature. And this, once it's finished, is going to be a pergola. But what this space really needs is flowers. The borders were always regimented, so we had a salvia every 10 inches, and in front of it we had blue lobelia, and then down the front, white allison. So it was actually red, white and blue. If you went into a street and you saw a front garden that looked a bit overgrown, you really felt that that was a, a, a mark of shame. The problem is, I'm a scientist, not a gardener. So I'm pretty good at using chemicals to kill unwanted creepy crawlies. I'm not so hot at the intricacies of bringing out the best in flowers. But 1955 saw one man bring salvation to Britain's aspiring gardeners. Ted Stewart, whose family had been growing and selling plants for two centuries. During the war, a lot of his plants were requisitioned to grow over and camouflage factory roofs from enemy aircraft pushing the family business to near bankruptcy. But Stuart was a determined individual. On a trip to America, he spotted a revolutionary idea, nurseries selling plants in containers. So on his return, he converted the family's potting shed and Britain's first garden centre, Stuart's in Ferndown, Dorset, opened its doors in 1955, changing the entire horticultural industry. <laughs> Thanks to Ted Stewart, you could now buy everything you needed. Alongside the container plants were tools and fencing, compost and fertiliser. Oh, and of course, garden gnomes. All under one roof. Gardening was no longer the preserve of green-fingered experts. Now anyone could do it. Would these have been popular in the 50s? Definitely. I've asked garden historian Twigs Way to help me choose the ingredients for the perfect 50s garden. And it's all about the decade's optimism and lust for colour. How big's your rockery? Let's see, the patio is probably about three by four metres. About the size of two bodies. And then two there's bodies? A, and then there's a, a rockery nice. around this. That's nice, yeah. yeah. Have you had it long? <laughs> <laughs> oh, ever since Auntie Mabel and Uncle yeah, Henry passed disappeared. Away. Yeah, away, OK. Red, white and blue, of course, was really popular in coronation year. Right, roses. We need lots of roses. 1950s garden. 
tons of roses. Even I know what roses are. This one's very nice colour for 1950s. It's that kind of Barbara Cart and icing sugar pink. Quite like a hair. The garden centre meant that even virgin horticulturalists could become weekend experts. Gardening had become Britain's favourite pastime. For the first time, you can go out and see an instant garden in front of you. All of the flowers in bloom, all of the flowers labelled, telling you what you want to do with them, where you should plant them. And what's more, they come complete with the earth, so all you have to do, take them home, turn the pot up, take it off, and plant them in the hole. It was so easy, it was like painting by numbers. What next? A cup of tea. Oh, yes. Very English. I like tea. Yeah. And a scone. My rockery's in, the pergola's up, the patio's finished. Once I've got the flowers in, my garden will be an advert for 50s aspiration and affluence. The garden was no longer a place people worked in because they had to, but because they wanted to. And gardening became a national obsession. My grandfather was a fanatical gardener and he had a little laboratory in the house where he used to do soil tests and stuff. And this was a guy who was a, tr a train driver on the Piccadilly line. Chrysanthemums were the closest thing to pure unalloyed pleasure that my dad ever had. And in the late 50s, he became the secretary of the Wanted and Woodford Cr Chrysanthemum Society. And I think that was probably the proudest moment of his life. Fifty science and technology transformed our gardens. Synthetic fertilisers helped the flowers grow bigger and stronger, while an army of toxic chemicals kept the bugs off. In ten short years, this war-torn food factory had become an oasis of pleasure. Taking our cue from the young queen, it was now the ideal place to throw a party. Buckingham Palace and crowds at the gates waiting for the gentry. The garden party had always been a rather grand affair. 8,000 people attended the annual garden party at Buckingham Palace in 1957. I've opted for a more intimate gathering with a few neighbours. And instead of champagne, canapé and polite conversation, sandwiches, cupcakes and, of course, a nice cup of tea. As we're in the 50s, making tea is even easier, thanks to a surprising American innovation. The tea bag. Must have seemed quite odd. Only trouble is, there's an obvious design flaw. It was made for dunking. So in 1953, along comes a British firm who make what could be our nation's greatest scientific contribution of the decade. This, however, was one invention the British were very slow to take to their hearts. By the end of the 50s, less than 3% of our tea was sold as tea bags. But we got there in the end. 50 years later on, only 3% wasn't sold as tea bags. The 50s changed our nation so profoundly, yes, eventually even the way we made the tea, that by 1960 you could be forgiven for thinking you were living in another country. 50s science and technology didn't just change the fabric of the home, it changed the nation and helped shape who we are. And the revolution wasn't finished yet. My garden at 21 Coronation Close is now the horticultural embodiment of a 1950s Britain looking to the future. The grey skies were clearing. We were becoming a more confident, optimistic and outward-looking nation. Britons wanted to broaden their horizons. Not that you could tell from the last room in my house, which needs urgent attention. The garage! It's a bit of a dumping ground, really. There's an old bicycle, deck chair, tools, luggage, furniture. I mean, it's full of rubbish. It needs a bit of a clear out. Now, you might expect to find a car in here, but in 1950, those were also in short supply. Most were pre-war, and only one in seven households actually had one. This was a golden age of public transport, although that had more to do with petrol rationing and the lack of any other option than our love of sharing smoke-filled carriages with 50 other people. 
the most affordable option for personal transport was a motorbike. And most had a bit of an image problem. What was needed was a bit of glamour. Something like the super sexy bike, the super sexy Marlon Brando rode in the wild one. And the good news was, we could have one. Because it was a British engineering classic. Brando may have been Hollywood royalty, but his bike, the Triumph Thunderbird, was the monarch of the West Midlands. Launched in 1950, the Triumph Thunderbird was the world's first superbike. A glamorous mass market motorcycle with a top speed of over 100 miles an hour. Life in the fast lane had arrived. That was a real feeling of, wow, this is modern, this is hip, this is cool, this is flying, it was wonderful. It was just a bit daring to go on a motorbike. What did we call them? Burn ups. Hit the ton. I hope we never did, but we probably did. Curiously, the Thunderbird was the same size as other Triumphs, and yet it was much more powerful. Now, as an engineer, this is the sort of conundrum I relish. So I'm off to meet my mechanised mate, Marty, to see if we can work out just how the Thunderbird got faster without getting bigger. And it's all about understanding what happens inside an internal combustion engine. The problem is, it's quite difficult to see what goes on inside an engine, so machine maestro Marty's made his own combustion cylinder. We have here a cylinder with a piston in it. So that's just like a car engine or a motorbike engine? Exactly. There's my cylinder, that's the piston. Okay. A bean tin. Right. Nothing in it. Now, there's a bit of a clue in the name combustion engine. It's all about combusting petrol inside a tight space. The petrol goes in the bottom of the cylinder, where it quickly turns into a vapour. We can then ignite this fuel using a spark plug connected to a battery. Basically, we're making our own controlled explosion. If we get a spark... <laughs> Even a few drops of petrol can produce an explosion big enough to propel our piston over four metres. Of course, inside a real engine, the piston would travel up and down inside the cylinder to drive the wheels. Basically, Connected to that piston will be a rod, and a little bit like an old steam locomotive, that rod can be used to drive the wheels, circular motion, on your motorbike, your car, whatever. And these explosions would be happening thousands of times per minute in a 1950s motorcycle. In the past, when engineers wanted to make bikes go faster, they built bigger, heavier engines to allow bigger explosions to drive the pistons. But the approach taken by the Triumph team lay in the classic wartime British ethos of make, do and mend. They wondered what would happen if we didn't touch the rest of the engine, but just made the cylinders bigger. To find out, we've now made our own slightly bigger cylinder. So we've got more gases acting on a bigger surface area, just pushing them out. Exactly. We'll put a little bit more fuel in here because there's more oxygen in there. So we can burn more fuel, we'll get more hot gases produced, Hot gases will push on the bottom of here, will get more force on the bottom because it's a bigger surface area, and that will push the tin flying out the end, and it should go further. So, will a slightly bigger piston in a slightly bigger cylinder make any difference? If this goes further, it proves we've effectively designed a more efficient, more powerful engine. Exactly. Give if. It, if. <laughs> Show me. Let's do it then, shall we? <laughs> Once that's vaporised. Should be ready to go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Proof positive. Slightly bigger tin. Goes, what, twice the distance? Faster motorbikes. Indeed, that's where you end up. Faster <laughs> motorbikes. <laughs> And that's the simple but glorious principle Triumph applied to the Thunderbird. They took an existing 500cc engine, enlarged the cylinders and pistons by just 8mm to produce a more powerful 650cc version, boosting the top speed from 85 to over 100 miles an hour. A bit of restyling and the result was spectacular. 
showed you what the British were capable of doing. Yeah. I mean, what's it like For people like my neighbour John, it was a revolution. This really takes me back to my youth when I was a young lad in the 50s and, and I sat on a bike like this and uh, you were sitting really in the future. It must have been like a Spitfire pilot when he was doing his first solo. You know, <laughs> something so very, very exciting. Were you conscious of people watching you? I would pause by the shop windows <laughs> to look at myself and think, gosh, there's John Stevenson on a Triumph Thunderbird. Is the world watching me? I mean, what would a bike like this allow you to do? Well, a bike like this was freedom. It was freedom with capital letters and underlined in red as well. You could go places with it. You open that throttle and, gosh, that bike was away. You could belt down to Brighton, have an hour or two on the pier, a fish and chips, and then back again for tea. But did it get the girls? This would, by <laughs> God. <laughs> They'd look at the bike and not me. <laughs> Motorcycling thrived in the 50s, and the number of bikes more than doubled, with one and a half million registered in 1960, the most there's ever been in one single year. Motorbikes may have given young Britons their first taste of independence in the 50s, but they were of little use to the family. That would all change with the arrival of this little beauty. As the British motor industry increased its output, saloons like this Austin A30 were now affordable to better off families. And in large numbers, we took to the road. Over the decade, the number of cars on our roads more than doubled. But with the A30 costing the equivalent of a year's average wages, the car was more than just a means of getting from A to B. It was a status symbol. My dad put all of his money into a car. It was his pride and joy. When he was driving, he always sat up very straight and he kind of made eye contact with a lot of the people that he was passing. Hi, I've got a car. I always, always remember sitting on the back seat with my brother, waving at everybody we passed and sort of saying, look at the big car we're in, look at the big car we're in, because we were really excited. It was also a time when disposable income was rising 3% each year. Families now had cash to spare, and with pay time off work, the opportunity to spend it on holidays. And they were going to enjoy it, come hell or high water. Sometimes my dad would get the cars in dodgy deals, and the most embarrassing car we ever had was a second-hand hearse. And we went from Fulham to a holiday cottage in Cornwall in a hearse. We had caravan holidays, we stayed in little B&Bs, we always set off in the car. The first time we'd got it and things would break down and it would always be disastrous. Bewed, Ilfracombe, Woolacombe. Uh, from about May onwards, you were looking forward to those few precious days when the sun always shone and when your mother would rub olive oil all over your body in order to ensure that you were burnt so that you would look good when you return home. And what better proof that you'd had a good time at the seaside than showing off that most un-British of things, a suntan. The odd time I went on holiday with my mother and the sun came out, she'd go to Boots and get a tiny bottle of olive oil and put it on us, and that was our sum total of our sun protection. There was none. There was a whole range of tanning products available to those keen to get the swarthy European look. The only problem was, none of them were very good. Well, this was a popular suntan lotion in the 50s. Baby oil. Smells all right. What we didn't realise at the time is that baby oil was magnifying the effects of the sun's rays. And worse to come, like all oils, we were actually cooking ourselves. So, in effect, yeah, we were getting a lovely tan, but we were actually basting ourselves like a Sunday roast. Nasty. If you wanted a deeper tan, you could always push the boat out and slop on a little bit of vinegar. Oh. Oh. Stinks. My father was very white, and he would never wear sun cream because that was so you know, disgustingly feminine, and he would always burn. 
he'd always be burnt. My father would always have these red stripes. So this one time he was hospitalised. Never learned. We could try this stuff. Red veterinary petrolatum, or red vet pet. Sounds a bit like a sheep dip to me. And it was developed during the Second World War to help prevent American soldiers from getting sunburn before it went on sale in the 50s as a suntan lotion. It was basically a petroleum jelly with an added red pigment. And it cut out some sunlight, but it didn't filter out all the harmful ultraviolet rays. It's mainly because we didn't know about those for a couple of decades. Horrible stuff. But why take the risk of burning yourself at all when you can get a suntan straight from a bottle? And here it is. Thanks to 50s science, the world's first self-tanning lotion had arrived. It was originally developed as an aftershave. It was aptly named Mantan. It looked a bit like this. Derived from sugar beet, it contained the active ingredient DHA, which reacts with enzymes in your skin to release a brown pigment. There was just one problem you did end up looking a bit orange. But it worked so well, in fact, that DHA still forms the basis of many self-tan lotions today. Just the ticket for a typical, untrustworthy British summer holiday. My makeover of 21 Coronation Close is almost at an end. And the rooms positively exude the optimism and enthusiasm for science I've come to associate with the 50s. But for the last stage of my transformation, I'm going to need to leave the 50s house altogether. During the summer, most of us would have gone away for a week or two on holiday to the seaside, often to a holiday camp, and would have gone away together in large numbers. Would have been extended family members, maybe neighbours from down the street, even a factory outing. While holidays were almost always fun, they certainly weren't exotic. Going to France or Spain would have been unthinkable, you know, and I didn't even know anybody who did that. There was one boy in my class whose parents went abroad and we just thought that was weird. Why would you go abroad when there's so much of Great Britain to see? By Great Britain, obviously, I mean England. But thanks to more pioneering technology, that was all to change. As a nation, we were about to take to the skies. A British invention gave air travel to the masses. For me, the jet airliner has to be the greatest innovation of the 50s. But then again, I would say that. I trained as an aeronautical engineer. What I think is truly inspiring, though, is the way one man found a way to make air travel faster and, by accident, cheaper. To understand how he did it, you need to go back to the type of engine that had powered all aircraft from the day they first took off. we have got a propeller. And we've got an engine. Yeah. And as the propeller turns, air gets forced backwards, it pushes it forward. OK? Yes. When you go over 400 miles an hour, apparently, mm -hmm. propeller blades stop being efficient. Well, that's because they kind of stall, because they're designed for a very specific airspeed. And above that, the air just becomes... It just becomes very messy, and the efficiency just goes rubbish. OK. The jet engine changed all that. And like so many inventions that improved the quality of life in the 1950s, it came out of the fight for survival that was the Second World War. It was the brainchild of one man, RAF engineer Frank Whittle. Son of a Coventry toolmaker, Whittle initially failed his RAF medical for being too short. He was only five foot tall, but he went on to become a giant in aviation history. He set out to build a high-speed, high-altitude aircraft and with the jet-powered Gloucester Meteor, he succeeded, in spite of suffering two nervous breakdowns on the way. He deserves an extra special place in my Hall of Fame. If it wasn't for the thrill of the jet engine, I don't think I'd have become an aviation engineer. It's thanks to Whittle that the world has shrunk and we've all become international travellers. And Whittle designed his engine to exploit an ingenious bit of classroom physics. If you burn fuel in compressed oxygen, it'll explode. Like the internal combustion engine, that's a bit difficult to see in a working jet engine. 
So Marty's blown the budget and decided to demonstrate the principle using a highly expensive prop. That's a pop bottle. This is the principle behind a jet engine. There's a bit of wiring, a bit of nitrocellulose. Nitrocellulose, gun cotton, it's smokeless explosive, OK? Mm. So we can ignite that remotely with this. Nitrocellulose gun cotton is a highly flammable material, and just a single spark generated by Marty's electrical firing circuit would be enough to make it combust, basically catch fire. Now, the vital ingredient for any combustion is oxygen, and the more oxygen there is, the more powerful the combustion. So, in theory, if we put the gun cotton inside a container and increase the air pressure inside, we should get a bigger bang. OK. Well, there's now twice as much oxygen in that bottle, so when we hit our firing button, we should get an interesting result. Right, are you ready? Good work. Here we go. <laughs> as the fuel burns in the concentrated oxygen, it produces hot gases under pressure that force their way out the back of the bottle, pushing the container forward. That was quite impressive. You like that? Yeah. I thought you would. And the power produced by burning fuel under pressure outstrips anything a propeller can do. And Whittle's genius lay in working out a way to produce that power 20,000 feet in the air. Is it a cowl? Is that the right word? Yeah, it is. He built a casing around the engine and got rid of the propeller. Well, this just means that having a cowl, which is like trying to put air through a tube, just stops all this high pressure just spurting out the side. We want it to go out the back. He then used a series of fans to suck in air from the outside and then push it into a smaller and smaller space, increasing the pressure. And he took out the traditional engine and instead he pumped fuel into the space where the engine used to be and then set fire to it. Imagine air is being scooped up by these cowls. So that's the first thing, we've got air trapped inside here. The next stage is we've got these series of compressors where the air is super compressed. And then we come to this exciting part here. We're going to squeeze, we're going to squirt some fuel into the mix and we're going to ignite it. And that explosion creates hot gases which expand a little bit like the pot bottle. That hot gas is now absolutely at massive pressures, tens of thousands of pounds of thrust, washing out the back here, forcing the engine and the aeroplane forwards. For me, this has got to be one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. You know, we're getting aeroplanes now that made the world a much smaller place. We could travel more efficiently at higher altitudes, faster. And this principle for the jet engine is still in existence today in all jet aeroplanes that you can find, well, commercially, in the military, wherever. It's just a fantastic piece of design. It's Whittle's genius that gave us the world's first passenger jet, the British-made Comet. Air intake here, fans to compress the air here, mm. fuel and injection here, turbines to power the fans here, and at the back, 10,000 pounds of thrust. The royal visitors were welcomed by Sir Miles Thomas, the chairman of British Overseas Airways, at the stand showing one of the most exciting of all the exhibits. Yes, it's that famous jet airliner, the Comet, the world's fastest passenger plane. Amid the euphoria of a new queen coming to the throne, the Comet first took to the sky. Ready at London Airport for the world's first regular jetliner air service, the Comet waits to take passengers aboard en route for Johannesburg. A new age of passenger transportation had begun. Thousands of us were taking to the air, jetting off to exotic locations like South Africa, the Mediterranean, Costa Brava. Welcome to the world of flip-up tables, duty-free shopping and the in-flight sit bag. With its sheer elegance, shiny space-age fuselage and air-conditioned cabin, the Comet made its first scheduled flight on the 2nd of May 1952. I was the first stewardess on the Comet. Most had their names done for a ticket since the aircraft was still on the drawing board. It was extraordinary. People just could not wait for it. Board and you took off and you just went up like that and you expected to try and walk up the aisle while it was going up like that, you know. It, it was... It was 
It was frightening, but very wonderful. Apart from brief stops on the way, the comet's flying time for the 6,724 miles was 18 hours 40 minutes, including haunts... Was... Powered by Whittle's engines, the flying time between London and South Africa had been cut by 10 hours. And that, for me, epitomises the dramatic change in British life, brought by the scientific breakthroughs of the 50s. At the start of the decade, the House personified an island nation still in the shadow of austerity and struggling with the challenge of getting through one day at a time. Yet in ten short years, the scientific revolution that transformed the home had also changed the hopes and aspirations of a nation. Talking to my neighbours, I've seen how the home and life became something to be enjoyed and even celebrated. What do you think? These were innovative times. Science changed what we listened to, how we cooked, what we sat on, what we ate. It had transformed the way we spent our free time, helping us to reinvent the garden and take to the roads, and even the skies in large numbers. We were able to travel faster, more affordably, and cover greater distances than ever before. Technology had freed women from domestic servitude, helped give birth to the teenager, and propelled family life into the modern age. This was the house, the home, the nation the 50s built. We had this extraordinary explosion of things happening. It brought in all the dreams, if you like, that we'd all had. I think colour sort of seeped into this bleached world throughout the decade. I think there was a, a general feeling that, as you know, Macmillan famously said, we've never had it so good. The 60s wouldn't have seemed nearly so wonderful and extraordinary if the 50s hadn't happened before. It was all prefigured in the late 1950s. It was all there, waiting for the explosion to happen. Thank you.